All right, it is seven o'clock. If you want to come in and have a seat, we'll get the doors closed, we'll get started with our Bible class. I was just telling Michelle that there is only one announcement, and that is that the announcements will be made at the end when the, when the devotional time starts, because I don't know what the announcements are. And then she reminded me that my wife is home on the couch not feeling well, so that's another announcement. So that's two. We're going to be uh, we're going to go back to Second Chronicles chapter 34 tonight. Before we get started, uh, let's bow in prayer. Father, we are so privileged to have a written record of your will for our lives. So much information for us to study and learn and apply. We pray that you'll help us to cherish your book for what it is the guidebook for our lives, the way to please you. Just pray that you'll be with us tonight as we try to glean some information and apply it to our lives. Thank you so much for Jesus who died for us. It's through him we pray. Amen. Amen. So Michelle was just asking, where is Mike? I don't know where Mike is. I only know that Mike is gone and Mike asked me to teach. We'll find out when he comes back where he went. So Second Chronicles chapter 34, uh, we, the last time I was up here teaching, we looked at that. We're not going to go back and rehash everything, but I am just going to uh, touch a little bit on what we talked about, and uh, then we'll move on from there. So the life of Josiah, I have found myself in recent weeks thinking about Josiah a lot and pretty much just really what's going on in chapter 34. This, now, it's also recorded in 2 Kings chapter 22. There's a parallel account, just a little bit uh, different information in each, in each place. Uh, but 2 Chronicles 34 is what we were talking about before. So we're going to pick up a little bit on that and then try to make some uh, additional applications for us. So one thing that you might remember, now, by the way, you had a little bit of homework after the last class. Do you remember what it was? Read the chapter. Go back, and the, the, um, the statement was made that there is something in this chapter for everyone. So no matter where you are spiritually, how you feel about your spiritual progress, your spiritual situation, whether you feel like you're in good shape or have some things to work on, or whether you think maybe you're just a spiritual mess, there is something in Second Chronicles that will help you. Okay, And it's helping me a lot, and so that's why I am revisiting this and trying to make some application here. So if you remember, Josiah, uh, and, and part of what, what appeals to me about Josiah's life is that he had a messy background in terms of family, in terms of father, grandfather, uh, the mess that, that was handed down to him that he chose not to partake in. Okay, uh, I don't know if I told this story, but when my kids were little, so I have, I have a, a son that's, who's 25 and a daughter who's 28. When they were really little, uh, with, the, with their grandparents uh, on my side were really just kind of a mess. And I told my son especially, so um, Ryan, when, when, when you grow up, as you're growing up, we're going to try to do 50%, at least 50% better than what my father did. Okay, and then in your generation, I want you to take it the rest of the way. Okay, I know that's kind of a strange statement, but sometimes you're just so impacted by the mess that you had in your family growing up that you hope just to do a, a little bit better and then hope for the rest of the, uh, of the progress to be made in the life of the next generation. When you look at Josiah's life, from a very young age, he's working to get it right. He's got a heart that wants to please God, and so we see that he becomes king at the age of eight, and then we see some very significant spiritual, uh, spiritual activities happening in his life from a very early age and that he's also trying to lead others in doing right. 
So as you look at the beginning of that chapter, and we're not going to go back and read and read and read in that chapter. We're going to try to move on. But he did what was right. He did not turn to the right or to the left. Okay? He was trying to stay on that straight, narrow path that God wanted him to be on. And he's, he's inspirational, at least to me and hopefully, hopefully to you. So around the age of 16, it says he began to seek the God of his father, David. Okay, I don't know what you were doing when you were 16. I was uh, a, a young Christian and didn't know a whole lot about what God wanted in my life. And, and uh, maybe Josiah didn't either because it was a little bit later that he actually gets his hand on the Word of God or his ears on the Word of God. When you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12, uh, the first few verses there, it says, remember now your, your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come and the years draw near. Okay, and as you continue reading there, you get the idea of what it's like to grow old, the things that happen to the body as you're, as you're aging, as things are, are not as easy as they were when you were younger. But uh, Solomon is, is telling us there, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Okay? For some of us, we didn't learn who our Creator was. We didn't know much about Him until we had gotten a little older in life. But the sooner the better, right? The sooner we get started in knowing who God is and what God wants, the better off we are. So around age 16, uh, the text tells us that he begins to seek the God of his father, David. Okay, at age 20 then, he seeks to, to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the things that didn't belong. Okay, this is an application that we wanted to make last time. What's in this for you and for me? What, what is it that is in your life that does not belong in your life? Or what is there in the lives of the people around you that shouldn't be there? Now, part of what we're going to talk about tonight is the mess that the world is in. It's not just our country, it's the world in general. And we want to learn what we can do to counteract what's going on in the world and be the best influence that we can be. But at age 20, so pretty young, I just think back to what your life was like when you were 20. He seeks to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the things that didn't belong. Okay, so if you look at verse 3 and following in chapter 34 of 2 Chronicles, you see there's, there's a lot of messy things going on. There's a lot of idol worship, things going on in the culture that, that shouldn't be going on. And what we see there that, he's, that Josiah is pretty thorough in that purge. Of course, we don't know everything that was going on, all of the negative things that were going on, but he's purging Judah and Jerusalem. If you look at that verse and the, the verses after that, he's eliminating the things from society that didn't belong there. Okay, but we want to make it personal because we can't do a whole lot to purge things from society that don't belong there, that are not pleasing to God. But we do have the ability to look at our own lives and work on purging the things from our own lives that don't belong there. Okay. So what we wanted to do from the last class is think about, take a very close look, self-examination, introspection at our own lives about just look at some things maybe that God doesn't want there. And we see that Josiah is being very thorough. Okay. He, didn't have, he didn't have pet things or untouchable evils that he wasn't willing to deal with. Okay, that's how I read this, that there was nothing that, that was untouchable. That's like, this is my pet thing. I know God doesn't want me doing this. He was looking at everything and desiring to get rid of everything that God didn't want. Okay, so what about you? Okay, sometimes you just think, well, you know, there's just so many things that I need to work on. And sometimes you just kind of push those off to the side and say, I'll get to that when I can. I know God doesn't really want me involved in this kind of thing, but 
I've just got so many things that I need to work on that God doesn't want that attitude. He says, no, just purge it all. There's nothing that is untouchable when it comes to getting rid of the evil, uh, the evil in our lives. He didn't allow any of those things to, to persist. You know, there's, there's something interesting here that it says the idol images he turned into dust. He just, he took those things and just obliterated them. And it says that he, that he scattered those things on the graves of those who sacrificed to them. So if you can imagine there's some, there's some nasty things going on, there's people involved in it. He goes and he's going to take those, those images, those idols, and he's just going to obliterate them. And then what does he do? He goes and he takes that dust and he scattered it, scatters it on the graves of those who were involved in it. I don't think I would probably carry things that far, but figuratively, maybe I can think about that. Remember the story that I, that I mentioned at the beginning about my own parents, my own father, and trying to do 50% better? Uh, when he passed away, I think he was in his mid, mid-80s, and he was cremated, and I remember uh, having charge of his ashes and having to do something with them, having no instructions. And I didn't go and do anything special. I put them in a place high above the city uh, where I grew up, where he, was, where he lived most of his life. But figuratively, I can think about those things in this sense too. The bad things that happened, I can just take those things and just think about maybe the reason that those bad things were happening, maybe who was responsible for them, and get rid of them purge my life of those things. It's just a figurative thing here. We're not talking about uh, grinding anything up and going and taking it anywhere. But it just makes me think about that figurative exercise of leaving that nonsense behind. Completely getting rid of the things in my life that God doesn't want there. Okay? Feel free to jump in, by the way, if you have something to contribute or if maybe you've, you've thought, have some, th- some thoughts like this as well. So Josiah had some noble priorities. His priorities were noble. Okay, so think about, as you're thinking about yourself, self-examination, what are your priorities? Okay, as we're looking at this text and what goes along with it here coming up, by the way, we get more than one class period to do this. What are some things that are priorities in your life Do you have the same noble priorities that Josiah did and purging from your life everything that doesn't belong and being very thorough about it? Okay, we can't deal with the the nasty things from other people's lives other than try to influence them. But what are your priorities? Now, it may be uh, how your time is spent, how your resources are used, Just really looking at everything about your life and and considering what can be done to purge the evil from your life, the things from your life that don't belong there. Josiah was doing that. He had noble priorities. And then when you look at verses 8 and following, I know it's kind of hard to, when I'm just making reference to one verse and following, you, you have hopefully a copy of God's Word on your lap, electronically or otherwise. But in verses, uh, this is 2 Chronicles 34, verse 8 and following. At age 26, so we talked about this the other day. So when the purging was complete, when he had finished doing those things, the next step was to set about repairing the house of the Lord his God. Okay, so he's 26 years old. It's the 18th year of his reign, still a young man. He has, first of all, set, about, set out to get rid of all of the things that didn't belong. And then the next step was to set in order the things that do belong. Okay, we talked about noble priorities, talked about getting things out of our lives that don't belong. But what about the things that maybe just need effort, need to have some elbow grease, some mental... Uh, a thought given to these things, maybe some effort put into them. Uh, think about a relationship, the relationships that belong there that are not in that great of shape. 
that need some work to be pleasing to God. Getting your spiritual house in order. Not just getting rid of the things that don't belong, but working on the things that do belong. Okay, so he said about repairing the house of the Lord his God. What are some things that you can think about? By the way, I don't want to just lecture the whole time. I want to hear from you as well. What are some things that you can think about in your life without getting too personal that you could, that are just general categories about things that may need some work, some, where some effort, some improvement could be made? Silence is my friend. If I'm silent a long time, people will talk. You just agreed with that statement, but don't have anything to add? Okay, what about um, Okay, that was the first thing that I listed. I have never really been consistent in prayer. And I think that that is something that needs to be put in order. Prayer belongs there. It shouldn't be purged from my life, but it's something in repairing that my household, my spiritual household, that needs some work. Uh, is there anybody in this room that couldn't do a better job at praying? Is there anybody that's just pretty much got it down and it's like, let me tell you how that works? Any hands? So that's probably something all of us, all of us could work on. Um, so prayer, rely, uh, prayer life, uh, making relationships what they should be, whether it's your spouse or with your children, with family members. Um, if we're going to have the right kind of influence on people, sometimes we need to mend some relationships, right? Maybe we've been kind of, you know, through COVID and uh, cancel culture and just being fed up with one another in this world. Sometimes maybe we need to go back and try to mend relationships, try to get things spiritually back where God wants them to be. Yeah, the things that you can think of, getting your spiritual house in good condition, repairing things. It's going to be a tough crowd tonight, isn't it? Outwardly, Say it again. Outwardly, uh, just the great okay. Okay. So working harder on reaching other people, is that what you're saying? Okay. Focusing on, okay, that, that, works, that works well with the question that I've written down. What is, what is the goal of Christianity? Okay, go to heaven, bring others with you, spend eternity with the Lord. Those are trained responses to that question, aren't, aren't they? A little bit. There's, there's no wrong answer to that question. Allison's like, oh man, see if I answer again, because like, he got me on that one. That is not a gotcha question. But what it, the ultimate goal of Christianity, flip over to Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. So the, the initial thing I thought of too, Allison, was go to heaven and take as many po as possible with me. And there's any other number of good answers. But look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. What is the ultimate goal of Christianity? Okay, Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay, based on that verse, and there was no gotcha there, based on that verse, what's the answer to the question? What is the goal of Christianity? It's right there. Mumble, mumble. Change. In what way? To be like Jesus, okay? To be conformed to the image of Jesus. To follow in his footsteps, to be like Jesus. Uh, so those things fall into place, going to heaven and taking as many people as possible. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost, right? It fits in there, but the goal of Christianity is for us to be conformed to God's Son. To be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. You know, the Great Commission said, Bringing others to 
Christ. To me, that's 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 at the top. Okay. Uh, bring in, uh, our our job is to get the gospel in the world and bring others to Christ the best we can. Okay, and that fits in this verse too, doesn't it? Because that's what Jesus did, and if we're going to be like him, then we're going to care about what he cared about, what he cares about. The Great Commission is there. So don't hear me saying that's a wrong answer, Allison. It was a really good answer, but this is kind of an umbrella answer, to be conformed to the image of his son. Okay, becoming conformed to the image of Jesus. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay, Romans chapter twelve, verses one and two. Okay, we want here's where the, here's what we want to conform to. We don't want to conform to the world. We want to be transformed in our thinking. That it all works together, but this is the goal of Christianity, to be like Jesus, okay? to be like Jesus. And you'll think of any number of other passages, too. I hope you're not looking for passages to try to prove me wrong. But this is an umbrella statement. To be con- Christianity is about being conformed to the life of Jesus. So when Josiah is purging his life of things that don't belong and trying to repair things in his life that do belong, we need to look like Josiah did at making things conform to the image of Jesus. Okay, what is it in our lives that don't look like Jesus? Let's work on those things. Things that belong but aren't right. Our, we don't have our, our spiritual household in order because we don't look like Jesus. So in verses, uh, this is uh, 2 Chronicles 34, in verses 14 and following then, in the course of setting things back to their correct use, Josiah has rediscovered the law of the Lord. Okay, now again, we want to make this about us, not about a history lesson about Josiah, but we see in the course of things that the law of the Lord is found And he's going to have a reaction to it when he finds out about it. You know, we don't get the idea that he's necessarily a reader and that it was his personal copy, but it came to his attention that the law of the book of the Lord was discovered. Okay, in verse 19 then, what does it say happened? Second Chronicles 34 and verse 19. Okay, he rent his clothes. How, how did he receive it? How did he receive, how would you describe how, that's what he did, that was an outward action, but how would you say he received the word of the Lord when it came to his attention? Okay, he was grieved, which means he was receiving it with that good and honest heart, right? That's what I was going to say, straight to his heart. Okay, it got him, it pricked his heart, it cut him to the heart. It, it did exactly what it's intended to do. When he read it, it made a difference. It wasn't just an exercise in reading and thinking, well, you know, I'm a government official and I probably should do something with what I just heard. No, it got to him personally because from the time he was a young boy, he was interested in pleasing God and seeking the God of his father, David, and not turning to the left, not turning to the right, purging the things that didn't belong, and setting in order the things that did belong. And so when he heard these things, he, rent, he, tur- he tore his clothes. And how would we, how would, what, what would you say in modern terms? I don't think, do you tear your clothes when you hear something that God wants you to? You do? Oh. I, I'm sorry.
Okay, when I read it, I don't get the idea that he knew that it existed. No, that's what I'm saying. When he discovered it, then he was disappointed that Bob should have known the law of the law. Okay. As you read this chapter, you, you see that what hit him hard was that his people were not complying with what, that, with what he heard. Okay, and, and, and we can't go too far beyond our own selves in being upset about other people not complying with what God's Word says. We can have an influence, right? But right here is where it's going to get, and then the repentance is going to be a change in decision followed by a change in direction. Okay, we're not going to tear our clothes, but if it gets to us, if, the, if a good and honest heart receives that, that seed, we're going to do something with it, and it's going to change the direction that we've been heading because we made a decision to change our direction. Okay, so this is what's happening uh, with Josiah. So he's getting, he's trying, sorry. Close to 26 mm -hmm. time. Right. Okay. How did he not know that this book was there already? Certainly there's some information out there. If, he, if he's trying to be like his ancestor David and not turn to the left or the right, he's got some basis for that, right? We, we don't want to speculate too much on no. what happened, but it's interesting to think about. At age 26, he's cluing into some things because somebody found a record of what God wants. He's not just trying to do what he thinks is right. Now he's learning what is right and finding out that his nation, the people around him, have not been doing things right, and he's going to do something about it, as we see. Yeah, it's interesting to speculate on some of these things. We don't know who dropped the ball, but we do know, we do know for a fact that what has happened historically is the temple has been used for idol worship. His ancestors have been into things that are abominable in the sight of God, and it makes all the sense in the world that somebody stashed that away because they're not, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So I guess we could indirectly say who dropped the ball? It was the people back yonder, right? The people before him. I'm no longer saying lame. You're talking about what? This is then start with Josiah. Uh, if, when you read the book of Kings, you find out every king uh, was not a good king. A matter of fact, the majority of them was rotten. They did not read right. the law to the people. They did not do those things that David did for the people. So uh, when I read this, I, 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 I think that Josiah was completely ignorant of the law. He didn't know it. Why? Because it wasn't passed on as God had told him to do. Right, and that, that's actually one of the applications that we're going to try to make over the course of this study is how we move forward with it. We can go back and look a lot at, a lot at the history, but what we want to do in this class, in our study time, is figure out what's in it for us. Okay, we can spend, you can go home and you can spend all the time going back and look at, looking at the history of his ancestors, of the kings and so on, and get a pretty good idea of, of, of the reasons about who dropped the ball. Uh, and Mike has brought that up about not teaching the fundamentals, going 30 years without hearing a lesson on topic, fill in the blank. When you drop the ball like that, you get a culture like we have today. We have a couple of generations now 30, 40 years worth of pushing God's will and God's way out of our society, and there's no shock then when we get what we got, right? When things are the way they are. Okay, we, go ahead. We've, uh, I know I was raised to always put God first, family second, and work third. Now, the world got it mixed up. Some people put family first, some people put work first, and God third. 
we've got some confusion there. Right. And just based on the average age of people in this class, we grew up a different way than the youngsters are today, are growing up, right? The way culture is now, we see those things that have gone by the wayside in the last, uh, the last couple decades. On Church Road. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. something that you know, wouldn't have happened even 15 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, but now it's a normal thing to have sports and for, because it's not a priority for two parents to keep their kids safe. You know, if you have a game or practice or something on Sunday during church or whatever, you're either not going or you're leaving practice early so you can be at church on time. Absolutely. So we can see some things that have happened in our culture that are not right. So remember, we rewind this a little bit. We're going to purge our lives of the things that don't belong and the things that do belong. Now, some of those things belong in our lives, but they need repair, correct? Those are okay things, but not necessarily under the circumstances that people are doing them now, okay? Same, the same idea. So we're going to purge our lives of the things that don't belong, and we're going to set in order the things that do. So in the course of setting things back to their correct use, he's discovering what God wants. He tears his clothes because he realizes that he is the leader of the nation of Israel and his people are, have not been doing what they should be doing. So he receives it with a good and honest heart. So if you look at Luke chapter 8 and verse 15, okay, the good and honest heart, Luke 8, 15, but the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Okay, so that we hear it, it gets to our heart, and it bears fruit because we're going to do something with what we've heard. Okay, now some of us, like I said, that this chapter, you may be doing very, very well spiritually, but there's something here for everybody. There's something that where, where attention uh, should, be, should be placed and we can do something a little bit different than what we have been doing, even if we're, we, we feel pretty good about our spiritual situation. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is take a little side trip. And uh, we may not get all the way through this side trip tonight. We'll continue it in the next class. Um, so as, as we look at, first of all, at verse 21... So 2 Chronicles chapter 34 and verse 21, it says, it says, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. According to all that is written in, in this book, our fathers have not been doing this. Maybe I didn't know what God expected of me. Certainly when I was a preteen, when I became a Christian, and I was at, 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 maybe even at this age, I didn't know all that God wanted. I'm not sure I know right now what all that God wants from me. But I can look at my life and read in this book and find out day by day some things that God doesn't want going on in my life, things that need to, to leave so let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28, some considerations that are there. Let me flip over to that. So I have a copy of the New King James Version here in front of me, and I have two bold headlines here. And the first one says, blessings on obedience. And the second one says, curses on disobedience. Okay, so in the, the, first, uh, the first 14 verses then, these are the positive things that are going to happen if you decide to do things the way God wants you to do them. Okay, if you go about trying to please God, here's some things that are going to happen. I'll just start reading here. Verse 1, Deuteronomy 28. 
Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. Okay, now we want to be a little bit careful here not to apply this too much to the United States of America, but then again, maybe it fits. Okay, as a nation. But think about your household, your people, the people in this room, about pleasing God and being set high above others who are not pleasing God. Verse 2, And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Good things are going to happen if you're obeying the voice of God. Blessed shall you be, verse 3, blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Okay, I'm not going to go through and read the rest of this. You can do it. You can even just kind of skim through it right now. Can you think historically about how our nation has been blessed as we, have be, as we were historically a nation who sought to please God? Am I all wet with this? I'm not seeing too many heads nodding. Can you think back of better times as a nation when people were more interested in being godly, more interested in trying to do things according to what the Bible says? Okay, even... Even our, four, even our, our constitution, the, the documents, the founding of our nation. When I, when I was coming on close to 80 years ago, uh, stores did not open on Sunday. Okay. Stores they didn't open on Sunday. Sundays were not about making money, were they? But now everything is open on Sunday. Okay. I was living in Germany. The first few years that we lived in the country of Germany, stores weren't open on Sunday period. You had to go and get everything you needed on Saturday, or otherwise you were waiting until Monday. Chick-fil-A. Chick Chick-fil-A. Chick yeah, Chick-fil-A, <laughs> Hobby Lobby, others who just, they're not going to be open on Sunday. That's the way it is. And of course, that changed even while we were living in Germany. People were looking at the opportunity to make money and things, things changed in that regard. Not, uh, not universally, but, mo but many, <laughs> many businesses. Yeah, but only one hour at a time. That's an old preacher joke, yeah. He works, works three hours a week. I'm just kidding, Mike, if you watch this. So, so, so we see verses 1 through 14, the positive things that are going to happen if people are trying to obey the will of God. And then in verses 15 and following, uh, we want to kind of look at that in the context of our current circumstances. Okay, so what happens, what happens if we don't try to live the way God wants us to live? Again? There's going to be consequences and repercussions. Verse 15, but it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Okay, that's a blanket statement that kind of fits, uh, that, that fits well with what's going to follow, some specifics there. Let me, let me ask this question. When, when, when God prepared the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey for his chosen people, the people that he chose to bring the Messiah into the world, were they, were they going in to that country and getting rid of the people who were there because they needed the space? Were they going in and, and dislocating, eliminating the people there to make room for the two plus million Israelites? No. Why were they, what were they, why were they getting rid of the people who were there? Say again? Why did God command? They're doing it because God told them to. Okay, it's a matter of faith, but because but because they would influence them and turn their lives away. Okay, because of the evil that was going on there, right? The idolatry 
And when you look at the life of uh, Manasseh, the forefather of Josiah, he was getting the Israelites involved in, in those same kinds of things. The influence was there, and Josiah is there to help get rid of those things and introduce the right things. In verse 17, it's going to come to pass, if you don't obey the voice of the Lord your God, to carefully, to carefully observe all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that these curses will come upon you and overtake you. So we see in Josiah's life, as he's, he, he's getting getting uh, an earful of what God wants, he knows that his people are not complying with what God wants. Okay, so what about us? When we get an earful of, and we know that we are not complying, that I personally am not complying with what God wants, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to obey and be blessed, or am I going to disobey and experience the wrath of God whether it's now or in the long run. Okay, it's the same for our country. Okay, it's the same for, our, for the, the, the people around us. So if we look at our current circumstances, now, as I study this, I think a lot about what's, what, what's going on in our, in our surroundings now. Okay, in the news, the peop, how people uh, behave, uh, just the general uh, living environment that we have now, I see a lot of applications here. But don't hear me saying that uh, God is revealing something to me here about what he's, what he's about to do. But I kind of think it's coming down to this. I, I think God is, uh, his, that in the, in the fullness of time, God is going to do what he's going to do to make things right. He's always done it with other nations, and it's scary for us to think about what could happen. But God is going to be consistent. He's not, he's not changing. His values don't change. His patience may last a little longer in some situations than others. But these things are still true. The blessings for obedience and the curses for disobedience. So as we... We're, we're going to run out of time here, but we're going to continue this in the next couple of lessons and talking about some of the same topic. But if you think about the, the Canaanites and why were they expelled from the land? Because they were completely evil and God didn't want that in the lives of his people. Okay, as, as hard as it may be to think about, about people being killed, people being driven out, uh, battles being fought, and, and annihilating people, including young, uh, including children and so on. It's hard for us to grasp that, but when we see what God's up to, it's not so hard to wrap our minds around. So in the fullness of God's time, it's at, some, at some point that cup of iniquity is going to be full, and God is just going to act and take care of business like he always has with other nations with other situations. He rules in the affairs of, na of nations. So when you look at, uh, maybe I shouldn't get too deep into this, but I'll just introduce Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 28. Yeah, that same chapter, the Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of heart. It's not too hard to wrap your mind around some of that going on in our world, right? When you think about madness and blindness as to what God wants and confusion of heart, it's all around us all the time, okay? Feel free to disagree with me after class if you don't think that's going on. But we wanna do, what we wanna do is bring this back to us and think about what was Josiah up to? How can we apply it to us? What does God want us to purge from our lives? What does he want us to adopt in our lives? What does he want for us to repair that is in disrepair, okay? Because the world is not, by and large, doing what God wants us to do. So we're gonna take a closer look at that in coming lessons. Uh, appreciate you being here tonight. Thanks for your input. And uh, we'll be talking some more about this Sunday morning.
Good evening. Last man standing when I start the announcements gets in, that gets the song leading. It's when y'all too. <laughs> I'd like to welcome everyone here. Thank you for being here for our midweek Bible study and devotional here at the Olive Branch Church of Christ. We appreciate your presence here with us. Uh, there are new bulletins in the foyer in the hallway. If you did not get a chance to pick one of those up on the way in, please do so as you leave or depart this uh, evening. Qu several upcoming uh, events uh, and depth prayer lists there. Some I would like to touch on. Kids, don't forget we have pew packers this coming Sunday uh, at 5.30 before the evening worship service. Then also don't forget Monday night for the master will restart on August the 22nd uh, of this month. And that'll be every second and fourth Monday of the month, but it will start this uh, in several weeks on August the 22nd. More details in the bulletin regarding that. And then also don't forget our last leaders kickoff, which will be August the 28th, which will follow the morning services. We'll have a potluck uh, immediately following that and kind of get last leaders kicked off. So if you are uh, planning to be involved in that again, great. If you've never been involved and want to be involved, that's even better. So the more the merrier. It's a great program. I encourage everyone who can and would like to, to please help out with that. There's help for all kinds of things that you can do uh, with that, both men and women. Uh, and also one prayer request that I do have, please remember Theo Smith. This is the great nephew of Raymond and Olita Montgomery. He was born Monday, uh, but he is in some critical condition with some, um, some very, serious, very serious health concerns. So right now he's at Region 1 or the Med, so please remember this little fella, uh, Theo Smith, in your prayers. And of course, the new mom and dad as they're uh, going through this difficult time with their son. Uh, those serving this evening in our devotional, Alan Zuniga has our opening prayer. Justin Jones has our closing prayer. Uh, Rick Forsyth will have our devotional, and our sound service will be Garrett McConnell. So at this time, we'll join Alan in our opening prayer. Would you pray with me? Our awesome God, our heavenly, heavenly loving Father, we do thank you for this beautiful day that you have blessed us with. We do thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to come here and open this book, open your, your word, Father, and study from, from your word. We pray, Father, that you will uh, bless us as we as we grow spiritually, as we can we can be, we can be looking for ways to, to better serve you and be better servants uh, uh, in your uh, service, Father. We also pray that you will bless this church, Father, bless this nation, bless the leaders in this, of this nation, Father. Help us, help them with the uh, decisions they have to uh, uh, make each and every day. Father, we, did, we also thank you uh, uh, for, for the many members that we have here that are willing to serve and uh, be a part of this uh, work, Father. Bless all the youth. Uh, bless uh, 
bless them, uh, bless all the teachers that are uh, that are teaching this this youth youth here. Uh, Father, we also uh, want to want to thank you for for the elders as well. Uh, they're 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 here. Father, we also ask a special prayer for uh, the person that we just mentioned, uh, Theo Smith. But uh, you know, Father, the situation. You know uh, which way you can help him out better. We we pray that you will do so, Father. Uh, Father, we also ask uh, that you will bless everyone else that's going through tough times, those who are uh, in the service. Father, for those who are uh, uh, overseas traveling, Father, uh, keep them all safe. And Father, help us as, as we as we go through this devo tonight that we can uh, we can be able to draw something and be able to apply it in our lives and and live a better life for you please forgive us of our sins and we ask all this in Christ's name Amen, Amen. You would go ahead and mark your songs to song number 989 989 it will be our song of invitation And our opening song will be 625, Zion's Call. 625. Good evening. On cue, Bill. Very good. I love to hear that. Um, tonight, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk to you about the roles that trials play in the life of a Christian. Um, one of my, well, this is my favorite verse of the Bible, is, um, is uh, John 16, 33, where Jesus says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. The beauty of uh, John 16:33 and other similar verses that talk about trials in the Bible is that there will be suffering, but also it, there, there will be many positive things that come out of it as long as we obey God, or excuse me, as long as we trust God. That is the key of it. Um, in John, John, John 16:33, Jesus tells us, he guarantees us, and it was one of the great things about Jesus' communication style, he was black or white. He, there was no ambiguity with Jesus at all. He tells us we are going to have trials, we're going to have tribulations, we'll have strife in our life. Um, but he's already, won, he's already won the war. That's the great thing about it. So he tells us that there are great things that can come if we trust in him. 
So trusting God is our foundation as Christians when we undergo trials. So as, as I just briefly mentioned, is that trials provide opportunity for us to grow in our Christian life. They present us with opportunities to become closer to Christ, who provides us the ultimate example, the ultimate example of, of trials and suffering in those trials. Uh, the greatest growth in people's lives, uh, the greatest growth opportunity in people's lives is when they undergo good trials. If we look at um, death, if we look at uh, broken relationships, whether it be broken marriages or other broken relationships, if we look at job loss, if we look at um, sickness, addictions, persecution, financial hardships, those are just roughly eight of the trials that we'll undergo in our life. Probably most of, most of us have undergone some of those, or we've undergone all of those, and we, oftentimes we've undergone multiple of those items at the same time. So the, the point being that in the moment of trial, it can be very difficult to, to understand what positive items are, what positive things are happening. But as we come out of the trial and we have reflection over the years and we have lessons learned, we'll see things if we trust in God that we may have never been able to see at a previous time when we come out of those trials. For example, um, you may lose your job and that losing that job may eventually lead you to have the best job you could ever have imagined. And, and so what was very difficult going on at that time could lead you to, to the ultimate career choice right there if we trust God. So it's difficult, as I said, to view suffering as an opportunity, but in 1 Peter 5, 5.10, Peter says, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So it says right there that many, many great things can come out of your trials. The Bible even tells us that we should rejoice in our suffering. Now for me that's a very difficult thing to do. I have never been able to rejoice in my suffering in the moment. That's a, a bridge too far for me as a Christian at this point, but it's certainly something I can I strive to one day. Um, if we look at James 1-2, James says, count, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. And in Romans 5.3, Paul says, more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance. Me personally in my life, uh, one of the great trials I faced was self-induced, and we, all, we often face self-induced trials, but in the late 1990s, I had a substance abuse problem, and it was a very, very low point in my life. And this was before I was a Christian, but fortunately, it set me on my path to Christianity. I was at such a low point that I asked God to either, one, take my life, or make a radical change in my life. And fortunately, a few years later, um, on April 11th, 2004, I was baptized. So a great thing came of that. So we have examples of, uh, we have many examples in the Bible, obviously, of um, trials that happen in the Bible. Um, Jesus provides us the greatest example, obviously, uh, with the trials that he went through in his ministry on earth. In 1 Peter 2.21, Peter says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Job, obviously, is, a, is another legendary character in the trials that he suffered losing his health, losing his wealth, losing his family. Job went so far as to question God why, he, why all this was happening to him and to give him an explanation to it. Jesus basically answered with a question um, saying that does he understand the workings of the universe like he does, like God does. Of course, Job, Job doesn't have that pers perspective. He doesn't have that wisdom. He doesn't have that knowledge. So, so Job had to accept and gladly accept the fact that trusting God was okay and, and that was enough. Um, 
Many times in this earth, when we undergo trials, when we undergo tribulation, we do look for answers. Many a times, these answers are not given to us, but that's okay. When we, when we leave this earth, we may not have the answers as long as we trust God. Trusting God is enough because he has the plan. He'll take care of us. So those, those questions to, to why horrible things happen, we may never get those answers. And we have to be okay with that, understanding that trusting in God is, is acceptable. Paul, of course, lost his freedom and was imprisoned multiple times throughout his ministry. And Paul trusted God, um, no doubt about it, and learned to serve God in any situation. Romans 8.18, Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. In James 1.12, James says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to him, to those who love him. So in closing, um, trials can be a great thing in our lives. And the only way they can be productive for us and they can be useful for us is if we trust in God 100%. If we do that, we'll see opportunities will open up. Things will, will get rewards, we'll learn things about ourselves and our walk with God that we never would have figured out if we haven't gone through those trials. So it's very difficult to, uh, to embrace trials, but, but it's something that we really should look forward to and view as blessings as a Christian. Having said that, I realize they're very, very difficult, and I don't mean to make light of it, because we all have gone through some horrible stuff in this room and that will continue in our lives. But if we trust in God, there will be great things that will come of it. So in closing, if you haven't trusted in God or you need to recommit your trust in God, this would be a great opportunity to do that. So please come up here if you, you feel the need to as we stand and sing, please. Heavenly Father, we're thank you, thankful for this day, this time that we have to come and study from your word. Father, we're, we're thankful that you have the power, that you have the power to rule, our, to lead us in our life, Father, and we pray that when we, when we face trials, that we'll lean, lean on you, Father, and look to you for our guidance in our life. Father, we, we praise you for your love and your power and your mercy. We're we're thankful for that love and mercy that you sent your son to die on the cross, Father. We pray that whenever we fall short, that you'll forgive us, forgive us of our sins. We pray for Theo Smith and his, and his family. We pray for the caretakers, that, that they'll be able to provide the, the proper care at this time. And just please be with them and that whole family to bring them comfort. And be with all those others we have here that are sick or traveling and keep them safe, Father. And, be with us as we head home and until we come back again the next time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hi, Mike Hickson here. Thank you so much for spending the last hour with us. We hope and pray our worship service has benefited you. If you've been a part of our Bible study, again, thank you. We meet every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Bible study. We meet again at 10 a.m. for our worship service. Then we come back Sunday evening at 6 p.m. We meet on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. We also have a Tuesday morning Bible class. We meet every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. You would be more than welcome to join us. Hope to see you next week. Until then, God bless.